It's also called Claus Fabric. It's named after its inventor and designer, Claus. And by the way, interesting tidbit, this leaf spine technology was designed back in, I believe, 1950s by Claus. It was primarily designed for telephony infrastructure within the service provider realm. If you recall the old school analog telephones, to facilitate the circuit availability, that's what the Claus fabric was designed. But interestingly enough, over the past few years, leaf spine architecture has taken over the world by storm. Now, before I get into the topology of leaf spine, a couple of things I want you to, from a terminology perspective, what I want you to keep in mind is, in some literature that you read, it could be called leaf spine architecture or leaf and spine architecture or spine leaf architecture, or spine and leaf architecture, or just could be simply referred to as a two-tier network architecture, or a cloth fabric. All of these terms could be used interchangeably, but what I want you to understand is it all means the same thing. So do not get confused as you switch from one literature to another literature. Now, in the two-tier leaf spine architecture, at the bottom of our network, we have leaf switches. So in this example, we have four leaf switches and we also have spine switches. And in this instance, we have three spine switches. And as you can see here, the way these switches are interconnected with each other, none of the spines are directly connected with each other and none of the leaves are directly connected with each other. Instead, all leaf switches connect with all spines and all spines connect with all leaves within that environment. So it's very important for you to keep in mind from a physical connectivity standpoint. It's a key concept. Another thing to keep in mind is it's non-blocking fabric. So today's data centers require a tremendous amount of horsepower. So you're looking at 40 gig, 100 gig, up to 400 gig type of fabric within our data center that is 100% non-blocking all the way from the down ports that are connected into the different servers and different endpoints that are plugged into the leaf switches all the way through the spine. And this model is horizontally scalable, meaning if you wanna add more leaf switches, we can simply do so until the spines run out of capacity. And then what we do is we just add another spine. And by adding another spine, it just gives us the ability to add that many more leaves. Typically, you would want to check with your vendor. In this case, you would want to check Cisco documentation to see how many leaf switches are supported per spine, depending on the spine switch you're buying. That will tell you how many leaves are supported per spine. It's an important design concept for you to keep in mind. Also, it's an ECMP design or equal cost multipath design. What that means is if there's a VM attached to leaf one and it wants to talk to a VM on leaf four, all three links that leaf one has and all three links leaf four has are 100% active active. There is no active passive anymore. It's all 100% active active and we can send traffic in a load balanced way across all available links at any given point in time and it's very, very powerful. And finally, an important element to keep in mind from the ACI design perspective is the predictable nature of this design. So in the three-tier architecture, if you guys recall, we also had sometimes what was called collapsed core, meaning the core and distribution was collapsed into a single layer, which also kind of mimicked a two-tier architecture, but it wasn't exactly two-tier architecture. And plus, sometimes you would have a single link between the core. Sometimes you would have like an ether channel with multiple links bundled together to facilitate traffic between the core. What that did was that created a lot of one-off snowflake type designs. When it comes to automation, we don't want any snowflake design. When it comes to automation, what we want ultimately is a predictable design that is always the same across the board because that's what facilitates network infrastructure automation. So in this example, let me show you something really cool. So let's say there's a VM on leaf one that wants to talk to a VM that's attached to leaf four. What would happen is leaf one would take this path 
and go down to leaf four using this path. It can also leverage other paths as well, but ultimately it doesn't matter which path it takes, it's gonna be able to reach that virtual machine. So what that means is each virtual machine is two physical hops away. This is one hop right here, and this is the second hop right here, all the way from here to leaf four, right? So two physical hops. Why two physical hops and one logical hop? As I explained, there are two physical links, but logically we could be using VXLAN overlay technology. So these VMs think as if they're directly connected with each other. In reality, they are two physical hops away, but logically they think they're just one hop away. So that's the whole idea of underlay overlay, which I will also discuss in a moment, but that's what you get with this design. Now, when it comes to Cisco data center switch portfolio, you have the class of Nexus 9K switches. For leaf switches, you can buy the Nexus 9300. There's a huge variety of different options within the 9300 family that you can buy. And from the spine perspective, you have this Nexus 9500 available to you and it comes in different form factors like the 9504, 9508, 9516 that gives you the ability to be able to have modular type chassis supporting the spine. I wanted to let you know what options are available to you when it comes to designing and architecting your network within the Cisco portfolio. Let's dig deep into the physical design aspect of ACI. So we already talked about the leaf and spine switches. Well, all the endpoints connect into leaf switches. Nothing connects directly into the spine. Now, there are some designs where certain elements may plug directly into the spine, but that's a more advanced level concept. CCNP, CCIE, and more real world type concept. At a CCNA level, for you, keep in mind that nothing plugs into the spine everything plugs into the leaf when it comes to network endpoints. So that would be APIC controllers. And typically you would get a cluster of three APIC controllers to be able to have a quorum for high availability and redundancy. You also have bare metal servers that may be dual homed into the different leaf switches, for example. You could have different VM workloads that are running on different physical servers based on the hypervisor of your choice, ESXi, KVM, Hyper-V. You could have different type of container workloads that you may be managing through Docker or Kubernetes. You could have an external layer three out router, which basically connects you to a non-ACI fabric. So if you have a legacy data center that hasn't been fully migrated over to ACI, you could use the external L3 out router to be able to connect to that network. You could also have firewall, IPS, load balancers, all that layer four through seven services also connected directly to the leaf. So as you can see, you get the idea here nothing plugs into the spine. The only thing that plugs into the spine are the leaf switches, the uplinks of the leaf switches, but all the endpoints plug directly into the leaves, including the APIC controller. Okay, so this is a gotcha. Some people may think, well, the APIC controller should connect to spine. No, it doesn't. APIC controller connects to the leaf. Even though everything is being done through the APIC controller, but it still connects to the leaf. That's by design. Now, Let's talk through the underlay versus overlay. I'm gonna keep it very simple. Everything you're looking at on your screen right now from a physical network standpoint, that's all called an underlay. Physical spine switches are underlay. Leaf switches are underlay. Bare metal servers are underlay. Routers are underlay. Firewalls are underlay. But then what becomes overlay is, for example, we may have a VXLAN tunnel between two VMs that are riding on top of this underlay physical infrastructure to allow them to communicate directly with each other. That happens to the VXLAN overlay that rides on top of the underlay that we built. Now, the cool thing about the overlay technology is it's regardless of how the underlay is designed, we can create different type of topologies to facilitate different type of communication. For example, using ACI, we could do vMotion between data centers, even though in between the leaf and spine switches, it's all layer three connectivity, but we could facilitate a layer two 
And for vMotion, we need layer two, basically, which means we need to be on the same subnet. Using VXLAN, we can extend and we can create an end-to-end -end tunnel between the data centers to allow a vMotion to happen between two physically geographically dispersed data centers thanks to the VXLAN overlay. So these are some examples. Now, at a CCNA level, that's all you wanna know. At a CCNP and beyond, we're gonna go into a lot more detail into ACI. And there's a lot of different logical constructs that are part of the overlay, like tenant, bridge domain, EPGs. We'll discuss few today, but to understand at a lot deeper level, you have a lot more going on that we'll discuss at some point in the future, but I'll still give you some additional insight into ACI. Now let's look at the logical design of ACI. Like I said, there's a lot of logical constructs within ACI. And the big thing with ACI is it could be scary for people at first because it's a paradigm shift. You no longer define VLANs and subnets in a traditional way, it's a very different approach. It's an application-centric view of the world. Remember, networks exist for applications, not the other way around. So networks are basically plumbing that allow applications to ride on top of. From that perspective, Cisco completely reimagined how data centers could be automated. And that's what ACI does. And there's a term called IBN. I kind of touched on it earlier, intent-based networking. Once again, the idea is, as a human operator, we want to define the intent of what we want the network to do in a very abstracted way, in a human-readable format, and then the controller can then take our intent and convert it into technical realm, things like CLI commands and netconf configuration to be able to go and program our network. In order to help you understand ACI logical constructs, think of a typical web application. A typical web application has a web tier. It's a three-tier application architecture, not to be confused with a three-tier network architecture. This is a three-tier application architecture. So a typical web application has a web page, that users connect to, that's that's called the web tier. Then there's an app tier, so basically anything dynamic. So for example, if I go to google.com, it presents me with the web interface, but if I go to Gmail, then all of a sudden, there's dynamic elements attached to that email, and all those dynamic elements are presented to me through the app tier. And then the third one is the database tier, and this is where all the information is stored. This is, for example, where my email profile might be stored. This is where all of the email data is stored. So that's the way a typical web application is designed. Now, one additional thing to keep in mind is you have an external tier, which is basically a set of routers at the edge of our network that allow the outside users over the internet to connect to the web server. And in ACI, we have what's called a policy contract, which dictates how that traffic flow is gonna look like. And the reason we have that policy contract in place is to only allow legitimate traffic and potentially segment off any attempt at hacking our network. If the external users wanna connect directly to the app tier or the database tier, we're gonna say exclusively as part of our external tier that we're not gonna allow for that to happen. External tier can only talk to the web tier. And similarly, we can say in another policy contract that web tier can only talk to the app tier. And similarly, app tier can only talk to the database tier through another policy contract. Now, if you were to combine all of these policies and EPG at the bottom of the screen that you're seeing in front of every single tier is N, Point group and what endpoint group or EPG is is a collection of different endpoints that are part of the same group. So, for example, if I have a bunch of VMs that are serving my web users that are all part of the same web page, collectively they would become part of the same EPG or endpoint group. Similarly, I will have different application VMs that are also facilitating the web functionality, they would similarly be in one endpoint group and similarly database. 
all the different instances of databases that I may have running in the background would also be part of the same EPG and same thing goes for all the external routers that are performing the same function. Now, ultimately, what ends up happening is that those EPGs or the endpoint groups and the policies, the, the way those EPGs can talk to each other, this is what's defined through the policy, an application network profile is designed per application. So what you're seeing here is for a very specific web application, but you could imagine you may have dozens of different applications in our network, and for each application, you would define a different application network profile with unique policy contracts to define how the communication flow is gonna look like. There's also an element of micro-segmentation and security that's kind of built in. There are different approaches. We could go very deep and do things at a micro-segmentation level, or we can keep things at a very high level. At CCNA, we're gonna keep it at a high level. <laughs>